Hi, and welcome to the WellBe podcast and show. This is your host, Adrienne Olin Smith, and I am so excited to have one of my idols and mentors, Dr. Aviva Ram, with me today. She is an amazing doctor, but also midwife and herbalist. She has such a fascinating background, and I just love everything that she puts out into the world. She actually just got off a live conversation with her audience regarding all things COVID-19 and coronavirus and birth, so she's just a really special person. And today, we are actually going to jump into information regarding thyroid health because she has written a book on that. And um, I actually went through her adrenal thyroid revolution program a year ago and have learned a lot from her on the topic. And I know a lot of people in our audience have questions about it. So I invited her to share her knowledge. Aviva, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Adrian. So great to be here with you. So first and foremost, as I alluded to, you have a very interesting background. You are a Yale-trained physician as well as a midwife and herbalist and the mom of four. So can you explain a little bit? I know you could write a whole book about your journey of getting to where you are, but just briefly, could you share sort of how you got through the different stages of what you've gone through and um, how you ended up where you are now? Yeah, it's definitely a bit of an unusual trajectory. I went to college when I was 15 to be a physician. Within a few months, basically took a left turn, became a vegetarian, hippie, studying herbal medicine, ecology, history of women's health. And that led me to really take a deep dive into natural medicine and midwifery. Now, this was in 1981. So this was so far before you could just kind of study this online or study this in a school. Um, Even the National Institutes of Health didn't have the term integrative medicine yet. So I had to apprentice to a midwife. I had to find herbalists I could study with. There were like three herbal books on the market at the time. And (laughs) there was one midwifery book on the market. So it was a journey of self-study and mentorship that ultimately led me to be a practicing home birth midwife and an herbalist. And then I did that for two decades, but for a variety of different reasons, largely having to do with um, women's health issues still being medically marginalized and women looking for alternatives, but not being really sure where to find them. And at that point, you know, 20 years later, you know, everyone and their uncle could take like a weekend herbal course and be an herbalist or call themselves a midwife because they had a calling and it was really confusing. So I thought, you know what, I really need to get an MD to really be that resource that women can get the alternative information from, but know that they can trust it. And at the same time, I really wanted to be a force for changing medical practice so that, you know, women could go into the hospital, they could go into a medical office and not be dismissed for their concerns or treated um, in a gender biased way, which is really still shockingly, you know, kind of rampant in conventional medicine. So I did, I went to med school, I went to Yale, I did my four years of medical training there, I did my internship in internal medicine. And then I did my residency in family medicine with a specialty in integrative medicine as well as obstetrics and have been practicing ever since. And so I have now a 30 combined 36 years of study and practice of midwifery, herbal medicine, and conventional medicine. And you didn't mention that all the while you had four kids because I did. He- <laughs> I don't know how you could have done all of that. Wait, actually, when I heard you speak on this, I was you know, jaw on the floor that you had four children who were all at home and then went to Yale Medical School, which yes, kills people I actually who don't have any. My kids, I did. I homeschooled my kids and um, then went to med school when my youngest was like ten and my oldest was already in college. Amazing. Yeah. Well, what can't you do? And I have okay. two grandbabies too. Who I got to midwife at home, which is pretty amazing. Oh my gosh. Did you yeah. really deliver them? That's I did. I did. My daughter-in-law is a pediatrician and has a master's in public health, both from Harvard and uh, was starting along having her baby in the hospital and then just decided that was over medicalized. So she switched to a birthing center and then a, a series of events happened where she just was like, can we do this at home? And since you're the person I trust the most, will you be my person to 
delivered my babies. And so I got to midwife my eight-year-old and five-year-old grandkids at home. Wow. Yeah. Story. I think I just got chills. <laughs> That's amazing. And then the you know, focus along this journey, uh, one of the many focuses, but the one that got me really into your orbit um, was your focus on thyroid health. Yeah. And I know that you wrote um, a great book called The Adrenal Thyroid Revolution a few years ago. And the thyroid has been kind of my only major last chronic health battle, you know, yeah. um, even though I, I count myself very lucky in that I have a very mild case, you know, it borders on almost not clinical or whatever that, you know, term. subclinical, yep. subclinical, thank you here and there, but it's the kind of thing that, you know, I know leads to other health issues and can affect things like certainly has affected my energy, my whole life, but also in the future, possibly, you know, breastfeeding and these other issues that I'm learning thyroid is involved in so many of the different functions that, you know, having a thyroid issue kind of persist without trying to fix it or understand any of the root causes is really a detriment to the rest of my life, you know? So it's been an interest for me. And I know it's an interest for many people in my audience, whether or not they've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or just hypothyroidism, or just think they might have a thyroid issue. So a couple of statistics that I want to mention quickly before I ask this question, up to 60% of those with thyroid disease are unaware of their condition. Um, women are five to eight times more likely than men to have thyroid problems. And one woman in eight will develop a thyroid disorder during her lifetime. So why are thyroid issues so common today? And why are they affecting women so much? Yeah, so the thyroid is really quite sensitive, as is our entire hormonal or endocrine system. And there's so many factors actually that we know are affecting our hormonal systems in general, but especially as women. And this includes everything from significant stress, which has a major impact on thyroid function, to environmental uh, toxin exposures. Many people have heard the term endocrine disruptors, which are environmental hormone disruptors, things like BPS, you know, or BPA and plastics that bind to our, our hormone receptors and can act like hormones. But what I think when we think of those endocrine disruptors, we tend to think of estrogen disruptors, but actually many of those are thyroid disruptors. They bind to the thyroid and alter thyroid function and often block thyroid function. Low nutrient status, you know, shockingly, a large number of Americans have been found by large studies done by the Centers for Disease Control, they're called the NHANES studies, N-H-A-N-E-S, that every couple of years look at the nutrient status and intake of the average American, found that 16% of Americans don't get a daily amount of fruits and 14% of Americans don't get their recommended daily amount of vegetables, or the other way, 14 and 16 respectively. Enormous numbers of Americans are low in iodine, selenium, vitamin D, and other nutrients that are critically important for healthy thyroid function. And so the list goes on of various factors that can be happening individually for people or often happening kind of at once that they're getting, you know, they have low nutrient status, they're stressed, and then they're not eating as well because they're stressed, they're not sleeping as well, they're getting exposed to these environmental factors, and then it kind of all adds up and over time can have an impact on the thyroid. I think as women, the thyroid is so particularly tied into our metabolism. So we have a lot of the symptoms that I think we notice that my women are going to notice that little five pound or 10 pound weight gain. We're going to notice the hair loss. We're going to notice the fatigue. Um, so we're going to notice those symptoms, but we actually experience a significantly, as you mentioned, larger number of thyroid problems. And this is partly due to some subtle interaction between estrogen and thyroid. So at different times of our lives, we have more of one or another of the three types of estrogen active. And those different types of estrogen can have different impacts on the thyroid. And so a lot of women around childbearing, around perimenopause, um, develop thyroid problems, but it's definitely intimately connected to our hormonal function in general. And then in turn, our thyroid affects our hormone, our female hormones, so it can affect our cycles, pregnancy, miscarriage, and as you mentioned, breastfeeding. Yeah, the rabbit hole of things I have learned that it affects upon really getting yes. into research is just, it's inspired me to make sure that it's something I don't let go on indefinitely because plenty of 
conventional and even some integrative doctors I've seen have kind of been like, oh, well, this is just something that, you know, your mom had and you're just gonna, you've always had and you're just going to always have it. And, yes. and I've had to be the one to push back and say, no, I've seen people reverse or at least severely reduce this problem and I'm determined to do it too. So, you know, can you help me? And, you know, a lot of people are like, mm. well, and there is a genetic component to it for sure. And in a subset of people, and you also mentioned that many people who have a thyroid problem are undiagnosed. And part of the reason for that is a lot of the symptoms that happen, like the weight gain, depression, poor sleep, increased anxiety, hair loss, brain fog, are symptoms that when women go to their doctor and say that they have them, we're much more likely to be dismissed as neurotic or complaining or making something out of nothing, or we're told it's just stress, or we're told it is anxiety or depression. So take a medication for that. So rather than actually looking deeper and believing women when we say something is going on, I've had women who have gained 30 pounds in three months, haven't changed their diet at all, and they go to their doctor. I had one woman who, whose doctor told her if she just controlled her fork to her mouth problem, she would lose the weight. And it turned out she had a thyroid problem. Oh my gosh. Also, who would say that? Just, I know. Who does? But people sense. do. How could, how could someone gain 30 pounds from nothing? It just makes no sense. But yeah, I mean, I agree that it's so undiagnosed because it's related to so many other things. And you know, my main symptom being energy or sort of fatigue is linked to, it could be so many things. You could yeah. just have a bad night's sleep. You could be, you know, sleep apnea. You could, there's just a variety of reasons. Yeah. And so it was, you know, sort of uncaught for a long time. But you then know, one of the things that we didn't talk about that's also really interesting is um, there's a really strong connection between celiac disease and Hashimoto's specifically. They kind of travel together a lot of times. And um, there is also some thought that not just celiac, but non-celiac gluten intolerance may affect people's thyroid. I've had people who have come to me with Hashimoto's when they've turned out to have true celiac and I've gotten all the gluten out of their diet, or they've gotten it out with my recommendation um, more accurately, their Hashimoto's completely clears up. So there, there may also be some factor that people aren't getting the diagnosis with celiac, but they're still intolerant of gluten. And that's causing a chronic inflammation that may be affecting their thyroid. And think about how many people live on wheat products all the time. Yes, for sure. And um, gluten has been something I have been very strict about giving up for that reason, even though I don't feel any sort of reaction to gluten ever. But like you said, a lot of Americans, especially with the quality of the wheat in this country, are gluten intolerant. And I'd rather be on the safe side of that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, I think I can avoid it. And I may as well try. Like you said, Hashimoto's is one of the thyroid yeah. uh, conditions, but would you mind explaining the difference between Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism? Because it can be confusing and a lot of, I've had just different doctors read the same test as I have Hashimoto's or I have hypothyroidism, which is wild. Yeah, totally. So hypothyroidism refers to a slow functioning thyroid and Hashimoto's is an autoimmune form of a slow functioning thyroid. So if you have hypothyroidism and you haven't been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, it's not usually an autoimmune form. The way you know the difference is by actually looking at somebody's antibodies. And there are a couple of different sets of antibodies. If the person has elevated antibodies and slow thyroid function together, they have Hashimoto's. If they have elevated antibodies, but their thyroid function is normal, then they are at more risk for developing Hashimoto's. If they have abnormal thyroid labs that show a slow functioning thyroid, but the antibodies are totally normal, then it's non-autoimmune hypothyroidism. So the whole thing is a catch-all of hypothyroidism. The only difference is whether it's the autoimmune kind or the not autoimmune kind. The not autoimmune kind is usually due to either a nutritional insufficiency like low iodine or low selenium, it could be that they have transient thyroiditis, which means they have inflammation in the thyroid. This is very common when somebody has a viral infection and the thyroid gets inflamed. It may even be tender to the touch, but they may not have antibodies developed. So that kind will usually resolve over time. The nutritional deficiency kind may resolve with treating the nutritional deficiencies. 
some people had thyroid damage along the way. Like I have a couple of patients who grew up in Eastern Europe and they were exposed to Chernobyl uh, fallout and that caused radioactive thyroid damage, but they don't have Hashimoto's. They just, their thyroid will never function normally. They'll always need thyroid medication to support because it was so damaged by the radiation fallout. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Mm -hmm. Now your book, which I mentioned because I had read it and went through the program myself, the adrenal thyroid revolution. Obviously when you hear that there's two things going on, adrenals and thyroid. So yeah. can you explain the connection between your adrenals and your thyroid and also explain if there's any other organs or systems in the body that the thyroid impacts? I think you mentioned the endocrine system, but also that impact the thyroid. Yeah, so the adrenals are what we think of as our fight or flight organ. They produce something called cortisol, which is a hormone, and they produce a chemical called adrenaline. And when we're under chronic or significant stress, or when we have a very significant one off stress, like, you know, you have a very ill family member that you have to take care of, for example. Uh, or if you have chronic inflammation, cortisol levels go up. And the idea is that cortisol is protecting you from that inflammation. It's providing a, basically a buffer to support you through stress. But when that stress is persistent and that cortisol stays elevated, the cortisol is telling your thyroid, hey, you know, there's some kind of danger here. There might be a danger of illness. There might be a danger of like this person burning out from fatigue and overdrive of their energy. There's a lot of demands on this person right now. So we need to dial back their thermostat. If you think about your thyroid, it's a lot like the thermostat on your house controlling how much you burn energy. And when you're in a crisis and the way your body registers a crisis is partly elevated cortisol and adrenaline, your body's like, okay, well, one of the things we need to do is conserve energy because she might need energy to heal if there's a virus or she might need energy later if there's a crisis. And so the adrenals tell the thyroid to turn down the thermostat. And cortisol does that in, a, in several ways. It affects the production of thyroid hormone it affects the ability of thyroid hormone to get converted from the inactive kind to the active kind, and it blocks your cells from actually using thyroid hormone once your thyroid does convert it. So it's kind of like shutting the system down to kind of, you know, set the therm thermostat at like 67 to save energy instead of burning it at 70 all the time. And part of what happens is when that energy gets turned down, you feel more tired you gain a little weight because you're not metabolizing as much. Your brain feels a little foggy. You might not sleep as well. You feel more restless and agitated. So a whole lot of symptoms can happen that then are the symptoms that we relate to as thyroid dysfunction. We even feel more cold, right? One of the things that happens when you have hypothyroid is you get more cold. It's because your body's thermostat is literally turned down. Everything slows down. It kind of goes into slow motion. The thyroid also affects every other system in your body. It's controlling your brain function, your actual cognitive abilities. It's controlling for women our ovaries and how much estrogen and progesterone we're producing and whether we're going to have regular periods and how heavy or light they're going to be and whether we can get pregnant and whether we can stay pregnant and whether we're going to produce breast milk controls the baby's brain development when we're pregnant. It controls uh, your heart rate. It controls your metabolism. So not only your ability to lose weight, but actually your ability to get energy from your food and in how you break down your food. So it can affect your so many things, like even your nutrient status. It can cause you to feel constipated because you're, you know, everything is slowing down. It really kind of affects pretty much almost every aspect of our well-being. Yes. As I said, the more I've researched it, the more I am just amazed how much it affects. And uh, I had a conversation with a friend two months ago about, you know, she, she was lamenting kind of this, the breastfeeding stigma and how hard it is and all the pressure and whatever. And when I sort of dove into a little bit further, I said, oh, you had problems creating breast milk. That's not, you know, you should want to know what's going on with your body as to why. And did you ever have a, a thyroid panel? And she was like, no, and this and that. And sure enough, she kind of went and checked and I had somebody uh, and she said, I have a thyroid problem. I would have never, ever yeah. thought about it if I hadn't 
been complaining about the pressure I felt to breastfeed and you kind of digging into like maybe why I, it never occurred to me. I just thought I was somebody who couldn't produce breast milk. Like and that's it's it. so sad. I mean, women who really want to breastfeed and are unable to because they can't produce enough breast milk, it's devastating. It can be really emotionally devastating. It affects your whole sense of confidence as a woman for some women. Yeah. When such a simple test could reveal the answer. And it's like no amount of breastfeeding cookies are going to fix that. And I don't know why doctors just don't routinely check it when women are having trouble producing breast milk. We just sort of like, oh, well, then just give formula. Right. No, that's exactly what happened. And and she kind of took the other side of it, which was as a defensive, like, why are make people making me feel like there's something wrong with me? And I was sort of like, uh, you should not feel badly about this, but also Absolutely you, should want, not. you should want to know what's wrong with you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there's a reason that happened. Well, or know if something's wrong, right? Because one, it takes off the pressure on some sort of internal sense of failure, which no woman should really ever have to have but it's so common. And so to understand, well, something actually caused it is really important to know, but also that same thing could make it more likely that somebody would have a miscarriage or have a thyroid problem later on in life and not understand why they're having brain fog or something else going on. So it's a significant cause of postpartum depression that often gets overlooked. Can thyroid issues get exacerbated by pregnancy? If you already have a thyroid problem, if you already have Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism, when you get pregnant, your demands for metabolism go up because you have to not only produce energy for yourself, but you're now producing energy for the baby. If you already have a thyroid problem, the demand on your thyroid is going to get twice as great almost. So you have to actually increase your thyroid medication automatically when you get pregnant by 50%. If you have kind of a latent simmering thyroid problem that hasn't been diagnosed, that increased demand on your thyroid by pregnancy can really bring it to light. And so it's really important for pregnant women to get their thyroid checked, which isn't done by all doctors, but it really should because it has such a huge impact on baby's development. A significant number of women will have some shift in their thyroid after pregnancy. So quite a lot of women will develop some postpartum thyroid problem, either a fast functioning thyroid or a slow functioning thyroid. In about 80% of women, that will take care of itself within six to 12 months. But you can definitely explore a little bit under the hood of why someone might be having a thyroid problem postpartum. And that could be chronic inflammation. It could be some sensitivity that they're having to something in their environment, but usually it's actually just the major hormone shift after pregnancy that causes it. A small percentage of women who don't get better after that about year period, it's a year to 18 months, like about 20% of women will actually continue to have a thyroid problem and then they would need some thyroid treatment. So that was my next question. Um, you mentioned the testing for thyroid issues as well as treatment. There are so many different things that you can do for thyroid treatment. Yeah. As I read in your book and lots of other resources, but can you explain first how to get properly tested for a thyroid issue? Because I think a lot of people, especially friends of mine say, oh no, I, I've had my thyroid checked by my doctor. I mean, there's no issue. Yeah. And I sort of assume that that meant that they didn't have the full thyroid testing done um, because they would have gone over that hopefully with the kind of doctor who would do that rather than just the conventional approach, which is like, we'll call you if something's wrong. Yeah. Right. You don't hear anything. And you're kind of like, well, I guess that means nothing's wrong. Or maybe they just went on vacation that week and never called me. Like, I don't, you know, that can happen. Um, Or we never got the lab back. Yeah, exactly. Um, So when you go to a conventional doctor and you think you have a thyroid problem or they think you could have a thyroid problem, The standard of care is to check just one lab, which is called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. That's a hormone that's produced in your brain that goes to your thyroid and tells your thyroid to start producing active thyroid hormone. And so when your TSH is low, that means your thyroid is functioning really well when you're, or it could be over-functioning. When your TSH is high, it means your thyroid function has gone down. And think about it this way. It's like if you knock on someone's door 
and they don't answer, you're going to knock louder and you're going to knock louder and you're going to knock louder until somebody finally answers, hopefully. And that's what your brain is trying to do. It's like, I'll send out a little bit of TSH, just the normal around, amount, knock, 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 not getting a response. Okay, well, I guess I better send out some more TSH, knock, 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 still not getting a response. And so it sends out higher levels. So if you get just the TSH checked and it's abnormal, if it's either too high or too low, that can tell you whether you have a thyroid problem and which one you have. But all it can really tell you is whether you have a high functioning or low functioning thyroid. The problems are that if you don't get your antibodies checked, you don't know whether it's Hashimoto's or not. So a lot of doctors will check the TSH and then if it's abnormal, they'll say, okay, well you have hypothyroidism, get a medication. Some of them will say, get your antibodies checked so we can see if it's Hashimoto's or not. We can see if it's autoimmune or not, or Graves if it's high functioning. But then they'll still just say, well, here's the medication. And they don't address the fact that something's going on that's causing you to have an autoimmune disease. So in my practice, what I do is I check the TSH and the antibodies at the same time because it saves somebody two visits, right? Having to go back to now get the antibodies checked. But you can have a normal TSH and have abnormal free T3 or free T4. Free T4 is the inactive thyroid hormone. Free T3 is the active kind. And that tells you not just whether your thyroid's working at all, but is it producing enough of the thyroid hormone that you need? There's a lot of nuances to how you, one would interpret this testing, but you could go to the doctor and get just a TSH. And the TSH can be fine or borderline and you have all the symptoms and it could be that you are producing enough hormone at your thyroid, but your cells aren't using it or your liver's not converting it to the active kind or all your thyroid numbers can be normal, but you have really high antibodies, which can happen for five years before you actually develop Hashimoto's, but it's a harbinger that you could ultimately develop it and you could be doing something about those antibodies the whole time, right? All the things that we talked about that you can look under the hood for. So a more comprehensive way to get your thyroid tested is to get a TSH, free T3, free T4, and thyroid, the two different thyroid antibodies, the antithyroid peroxidase and the antithyroglobulin. Even if you don't get the antithyroglobulin, those first four tests I mentioned are sort of like the best complete package that you can do for a really good starter overview. And for pregnant women, I absolutely recommend them getting that full package. But you have to ask your doctor. And then also, um, there's so much over-testing that's done in conventional medicine and so much over-testing that's done in functional medicine that I think a lot of doctors are just hesitant to be over-testers. So, you know, talking with them and saying, this is why I want this, you know, I, I heard about this and I'd really like to have a complete thyroid panel. Or if they're not willing to do it, which some of them won't be willing to do it, say, would you start out with the TSH? And if that comes, or would you start out with the TSH and at least the antithyroid peroxidase? And if that comes back abnormal, then there's protocols to actually check further. Yeah, the full thyroid panel is the thing I've had to explain to people a few times about how it's yep. different. Um, because, you know, rightfully so, if you're not interested or you haven't been diagnosed and gone on a research rabbit hole yeah or seen you know someone like you speak then you sort of assume you know a normal annual blood test test for everything that's needed right so right exactly why I question well, that? and then there's the another uh, there's another layer to all of this which you know but it's how you interpret the tsh so there's different schools of thought on how to interpret it so in the conventional most standard school of thought it can be normal up to 4.8 or 5, depending on the lab and their range, but it could even be considered subclinical, like you mentioned, all the way up to 10. But a lot of studies have shown that people whose thyroid TSH is even over 3.5 are going to be symptomatic. And so some doctors, you know, you'll go in and the normal range is like whatever 0.5 to 4.8 and yours is 4.6 and your doctor says you're fine and you're feeling like crap and barely can get out of bed in the morning and they're telling you you're fine but they're only like two tenths of a degree off from the actual abnormal level right so yeah. 
sometimes you have to advocate for yourself too and remind doctors, look, it's not just the numbers, it's the numbers and how I feel. Right. And also, why would you wait to fall off a cliff when you could do something about it before you get there? Medicine is very black and white. It's like either you have it or you don't have it. You know, to me, it's like boiling water, right? Technically, water doesn't boil until it's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But if it's 210 degrees and it's simmering and the flame is still on on the burner, it's going to boil. So like if you're heading there and someone feels awful, then treat. And we know from medical studies that have been published in big medical journals like New England Journal of Medicine and Journal of the American Medical Association and The Lancet that particularly women, especially as we get older, our cardiac function and our brain function is actually better when we keep to a range that's a little bit tighter within normal than if we just let it kind of go overboard. Right. And so with the TSH kind of like alarm bell going off. Yeah. Um, the couple of different doctors I've seen, you know, all more or less in the functional holistic medicine space agree that I think it was like a two, 2.0 that, or 2.5, they wanted me to be below yeah. for my TSH. So I'm curious what you use with your patients as the like, yeah, I don't have one standard. So if I have someone who comes to me and she is 62 years old and her TSH is 4.2 and she feels amazing that's within normal. And I see no reason to put her on a medication or give her some elaborate protocol. If she feels great and everything is otherwise fantastic. If someone is at 3.9 and they're struggling to get out of bed in the morning and their hair is falling out and they're constipated and they have all the signs of hypothyroid and they want to start on treatment, I will start them on treatment and see if that helps them feel better. The one time that I do keep Uh, women within a very strict parameter is when they're trying to conceive or and or if they've had a fertility problem especially and they're trying to conceive the reproductive endocrinologist and fertility doctors really like women's TSH to be around 1.5 to 2.5 for optimal conception which I think says something about optimal health in general because we know that studies that have looked at people who have no thyroid symptoms their TSH does tend to fall out between about 1.5 and 2.8 So um, that is one time if a woman has struggled with her fertility, had miscarriages, is trying to get pregnant, has a history of postpartum depression, has had trouble breastfeeding, or is having trouble breast milk production, then I will work to get the thyroid to that tighter number. Okay. That makes sense. I remember my sister-in-law telling me after she gave birth the first time and wasn't particularly interested in health content, but said to me, it just kind of makes me think all those things I was told I shouldn't be doing or eating when I was pregnant that's probably how I should live, right? <laughs> like, yeah, more or less. Like, I think sense. that optimal fertility is a generally good indicator of optimal health, right? Right. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned treatment. So would you mind just briefly? I know we, you know, have a, there's so much depth that we could go into on all yeah. these topics, but this is sort of an overview of all thyroid health. So the different treatment options, both medication, uh, natural and synthetic, and then some of the other things that you've seen to be effective. Um, Sure, sure. When someone comes to me with a thyroid problem, let's say they have Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism, the first thing I'm going to do is see how they're feeling and what their values are. And that will help determine whether to start a medication initially or to try other things first. So if having a slow functioning thyroid is really affecting someone's quality of life. And also there's somebody who is just like, yes, I want to start a medication. Then I'll start usually with either one of the more natural options if they'd like to, or I'll start with a synthetic option. Most people who come to me are going to want to start with something like uh, West Throid, you know, WP Throid, one of the more natural nature Throid, one of the more natural hormone options. Some women uh, who are trying to get pregnant or who are pregnant, and if they're not working with me, because I'm not attending births anymore as a regular thing that I do, just just when I have grandchildren, you know, Um, (laughs) occasional friends and family births, but um, because they're going to be working most likely with a conventional medical provider, most conventional medical providers are only comfortable with Synthroid or Armour Thyroid. Those are the two that they're familiar with. Synthroid is a synthetic thyroid, like the name says. Armour is a desiccated glandular thyroid. And so uh, that was actually what was available originally before Synthroid came on the market. And both of those are really good 
pretty standardized medications that are easy to access. So anytime I have someone who's working with another provider, I'll usually start on those because then if the other provider for some reason needs to adjust those medications or just wants to feel comfortable with it, then those are easy to access. The other thing is that- Can I, can I interrupt one? Yeah, yeah. Just in case anybody doesn't know what that is, a synthetic thyroid hormone is a pharmaceutical, so that's you know a drug, um, but then a desiccated glandular thyroid is- They are still all pharmaceuticals. Okay, that is yeah. all. So you can actually get products at like supplement stores and online that are desiccated thyroid or desiccated other glandulars. And I don't ever use those in my practice. Like if they're over the counter products like that, I don't trust their quality. And I don't think there's any reason for human beings to take desiccated adrenals or anything like that. But Synthroid is the synthetic version and Armor is actually from, it's made from pig thyroid gland. All of them are pharmaceuticals. I have to write a prescription, whether it's West WP Throid or Nature Throid or Synthroid or Armor, a physician has to write or a nurse practitioner, someone who can prescribe actually has to write a prescription. The problem with some of the alternative ones also is they're so heavily prescribed that sometimes there are shortages. And for pregnant women, I don't want to have to start them on a medication and then switch it while they're pregnant and try to get the right dose. The, having the right dose is so important. So that's another reason for women trying to conceive and pregnant, I will often start them on either Armour or Synthroid, unless they're just completely opposed to the synthetic and then I'll use Armour. You know, a lot of times people come to me, they wanna be on something more natural and I'm always really happy to use those. Also, uh, Synthroid, for example, has some fillers. Uh, some of the others are really just much more pure medications. And so for people who are sensitive to little bits of gluten or little bits of other fillers, some of the other alternatives like um, Nature Throid are often well, very well tolerated. So if someone's really, you know, it's affecting their quality of life, they're tired, they can't focus, they want to start a medication, I'll start them right off on it, especially if their numbers are pretty high. If their numbers are like really pretty close to a good normal and they're having some symptoms, then we'll always start with lifestyle first. Or if someone's not trying to conceive or not pregnant, and their numbers even are a little bit elevated, but they don't want to start on a medication first, we'll often start with lifestyle, in which case I'll start with an elimination diet, um, looking at any environmental factors, like are they drinking out of plastic bottles where phthalates can be affecting their thyroid? Are they using uh, lotions and potions and hair things that could be affecting their thyroid? Uh, perfumes have a lot of phthalates and all of these things can affect the thyroid. I'll get them to filter their water and have or use non-fluoridated water just because fluoride can um, block iodide from binding to the thyroid. So I'll look at things like that and make those alterations. That's a lot of what I talk about in the book. Of course, reducing stress. We talked about the impact of adrenals on thyroid. I'll look for any stealth viruses that, you know, sometimes somebody could have Epstein-Barr virus that might be triggering an autoimmune reaction. So I'll look to all of those aspects of their lives. One of the things that I'll also do is add in a supplement protocol for my patients, usually a baseline of things that are known to support the thyroid or that when we're low in may cause a thyroid problem. So vitamin D, I'll usually do 2,000 to 4,000 units a day. Iodine, it depends on their iodine level, that, but I'll supplement. And if they're pregnant, I'll, I'll do a higher amount. And then selenium, 200 micrograms a day of selenium. And that provides the core nutrients that the thyroid needs. I might also add in some herbs. For example, ashwagandha is one of my favorite because it helps reduce stress. It's anti-inflammatory. It may have some mild antiviral activity. And also it's been shown to help support the thyroid. For women who are struggling with their weight because of thyroid, interestingly, ashwagandha has also helped people to lose weight without even changing their diet or increasing their exercise, probably because it's helping with these other things like reducing inflammation. So um, that's kind of a core protocol that I'll add on to the lifestyle support. And then we'll wait and see it. You know, it all depends. It's so individualized on how they're feeling, what their numbers are looking like. I'll usually check thyroid again in six weeks or 12 weeks. And then as much as every 12 weeks to see, are they improving? Are their symptoms improving? And, and then we'll continue to make the decision based on that. Some people feel, you know, after three or six months, their numbers aren't improving that much. Maybe they want to start medication. 
other people they're improving so much they don't need the medication or some people are improving enough that they were like you know let's just wait another few months and see how this goes because not everybody has to have medication it's really how much is it affecting you and impairing you and how high are those numbers clinically in conventional medicine technically you can go up to a tsh of 10 and still consider it subclinical and not even treat it's really that's considered the physician's discretion so wow i work with my patients on you know what they want and how they feel again the exception being women trying to conceive and then i i usually will start medication if they're not in that range yeah so with all the different things that you would sort of prescribe at, from a lifestyle perspective to begin to treat someone's thyroid, are there any that pop out as sort of, you know, the majority of the pie or larger percentage of impact on the thyroid than others? You know, is it critical they follow a particular diet or have you seen like a, you know, a consistent meditation practice do wonders or are there any things that pop out to be more important than you the know, other? There's no one thing that we can say, right? I mean, certainly for people who have a genetic predisposition and we don't know how many people that is because we don't check genetics on people with thyroid. We just know it because their family had it, right? Right. So I would say that's a pretty clear one. And I think that's an important one to know because having some acceptance can really help ease your mind as you approach the solutions and it can help you set realistic expectations. I have, like I said earlier, um, two patients actively in my practice now who both were born in Eastern Europe. Chernobyl happened when they were kids. And um, not only did they have thyroid problems, but their entire families have thyroid problems like Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism, thyroid nodules, and one with thyroid cancer in one of the family members. So in that case, it's not so much about chasing the solution as supporting the thyroid the best we can and providing the medication because the thyroid's basically been so damaged. So it really depends on you know looking at what their exposure is. Like I mentioned, I will always check for celiac in all of my patients with Hashimoto's, not so much just hypothyroidism, but Hashimoto's. And if they have celiac, that's got to be treated to heal the thyroid. And those that is something that you can heal one and get tremendous response in the other. Nutritional deficiencies are a certain percentage. So it's really variable. Yeah, I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. I wish there was one. I would say that um, as far as the antibodies, I would say reducing inflammation and making sure that they're getting selenium one of the supplements that I didn't mention that's probably one of the most core supplements in my thyroid protocol is myo-inositol for helping to also support the thyroid and reduce thyroid antibodies. Okay. That's a great tip. I have some antibodies I'd like to get rid of, but I know we're coming up on time and this has been a fantastic overview of thyroid health. Um, so just, you know, if you wanted to say another few sentences just on somebody, you know, if they're not going to go get a test, but they're realizing that they have a thyroid and that they just want to make sure they're supporting it in a daily way, you know, what are some of the, you know, non-therapeutic things that you recommend for all people to yeah, make sure for that all people. And I think, you know, given that one in eight women will have a thyroid problem in her lifetime, that's a lot of us. And so looking at the things that we can do to support our immunity keep our inflammation reduced and, and address our stress, right? Like the world is so full of no shortage of, of so many kinds of stressors, especially for women. So some time in nature, a daily self-care practice, even if it's 10 minutes, you know, even if it's like putting on a beautiful lotion before bed and having a five minute meditation when you wake up in the morning, those are just super important things. And then one of the things that we didn't talk about that really does affect women a lot is blood sugar imbalances and especially going hungry and not eating steadily throughout the day. And that can really activate the adrenals, which can affect the thyroid. So, you know, keeping your blood sugar steady, making sure you're getting great nutrition, you know, just like a healthy lifestyle, a good, healthy Mediterranean diet to me is sort of the foundational way to eat. That's basically it. Yeah. And I think for some of us, the COVID-19 quarantine situation has allowed us to see that, you know, a more balanced, more well-rounded life is an important thing for our health and the way that we feel. Yes. It's like the um, silver lining in a cloud that is so unfortunate that it's taken so many people this. I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of people saying, I thought I would hate working from home. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Or 
I'm playing with my kids more or I'm sleeping more or I'm eating better. Or, you know, you see people who are getting out in their neighborhoods and walking together as families. So, you know, I hope this COVID-19 situation levels out and ends as quickly as possible. And I hope like some other viruses, it just either, you know, fades into history or becomes something mild. But I do hope that you know, and my heart goes out to people who have had just tremendous losses during this time and, and grief and trauma. And I also hope that we can rebuild something new as a culture, but also maintain some of this inner healing that in the midst of this weird, crazy anxiety and overwhelm of this external situation, many people are finding. Yeah, I, I certainly hope we take the lessons, a lot of us, not just those who have been more directly affected, but those of us who are just realizing that there's a different way to live life, you know? Yeah. So. Like, oh, wow. Huh. I've been in balance for a while and rushing around like crazy. And I know what it's like to just wake up slowly and have my own schedule again and have time to eat and think and breathe. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times in New York City during, you know, normal times I forget to eat lunch. And now there's, you know, a different approach. I could still forget to eat lunch, but now I'm just slower in general and I wouldn't do that to myself. Yeah. You know, I don't- well, And I people are remembering to cook and, and I don't know, have family time. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you the last question that we ask every WellBe expert, which is how do you get WellBe? Very much on this topic. So this is your absolute cannot miss wellness practices or practice um, that if you do miss it, if you're just, you know, traveling crazy, you, you really feel the impact. I get well be by three really sort of core critical things in my life. One is even when I'm traveling, no matter what I'm doing, I am pretty impeccable about eating a healthy diet. I'm really committed to sleeping seven hours a night. And I'm very committed to paying attention to my body so that when I start to have the earliest signs that I'm doing too much or I'm feeling overwhelmed or stressed, I actually give myself what I call permission to pause, which is just sort of stopping, shutting my computer, stepping away from whatever I'm doing and doing something that's replenishing, even if it's just like a 10 minute dance party or watching you know, a quick comedy on YouTube. That's when I will keep the computer on or phoning a friend or getting outside. Those are the three well-be things for me that are non-negotiables. Yes, that's, that's exactly what the uh, I Get Well-Be series is all about, the non-negotiables that keep you well. I remember reading about permission to pause, which I loved uh, when I read your book. And I've definitely taken it to heart and realized, or at least been a lot more in tune with my own when that bucket is about to overflow. Yes. Uh, like, this is all too much, just trying to like, right before it does. And it still happens to me, like the bucket starts to get full and I feel those feelings and I realize that I'm feeling uncomfortable, but then I have to step back and what do I need to, like, what's the release valve? What needs to be let out? What's a comfortable level that I can carry and not feel like I'm carrying too much. Yeah, agreed. And also paying more attention these days, at least I am, to not so much what you think you should be doing to relieve that stress, but like what feels good at that time. Yes, exactly. Maybe sometimes you do just need to talk to somebody because you've been alone in your own thoughts for a whole day, or maybe you just need sunshine or, yeah. you know, something. hydration. Right. I just need a glass of yeah. water. Yeah. You know, I, one of my um, classes when I was in my medical training, it was a mental health class and it was with a psychologist who'd been in practice for like 40 years. And he said he had found the secret to a happy life. And we were all like, what, what? And it was so simple and so elegant. And it has stuck with me all this time, which is figure out what makes you feel bad and do less of that and figure out what makes you feel good and do more of that. And I thought, I think he's right. I think that is the secret. <laughs> Yeah. And the first step of that is the hardest of all, which is the self-awareness to know exactly. what makes you feel bad. And right. Like we're never taught to pay attention as kids or, or in our culture that how we eat affects how we feel or whether we're sleeping affects how we feel or whether we're stopping to take deep breaths or getting sunshine or hydrating. So it really is. It does mean like we have to pay attention to our bodies and our emotions as a vital sign all the time. Right. And connect the dots between a day that you happen to not move at all and not go outside and feeling a little down that night. Exactly. It's not a coincidence, you know, when that right. happens. Or the two glasses of red wine in the evening and waking up 
blue and puffy feeling, you know, you feel like sad and puffy the next morning. You're like, what, what? Like, oh, right. Maybe that doesn't feel so good. It feels good in the minute, but not in the long run. Absolutely. All right. Well, Viva, thank you so much for sitting down with the Wellbe audience to give us all this great information about thyroid health. I think that it's pleasure. Very confusing for a lot of people and so prevalent that it's worth really distilling it down and making sure that everybody, whether they've been diagnosed with something or not, has a good understanding of it so they can look out for it in their own health and life and with their friends and family, especially their female friends and family members. Yep. So that just like that friend of mine who was having this breastfeeding trouble, you know, they could maybe say, hey, have you had a thyroid test and solve a problem that, you know, might have been turned into something else, you know, misdiagnosed depression or this and that. So it's yep. uh, incredibly important. So thank you again. Thank you.